Coming up on DTNS, host a talk and get paid by Twitter. Snap makes some big strides in the AR race, and Patrick Norton catches us up on right to repair and what our rights actually are. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 21st, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. Somewhere in St. Louis, I'm Patrick Norton. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Before the show, we were talking about rubber bands and the fact that Patrick has a lot of them and uses them, in fact, <laughs> for all sorts of things, such as entertaining the children. If you want to know more about that wider conversation, get on it. Our expanded show, Good Day Internet, is all yours if you become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A new tax agenda from the U.S. Treasury Department proposes that any cryptocurrency transfers worth $10,000 or more must be reported to the IRS. The IRS updated its guidance late last year, requiring taxpayers to declare if they purchased, traded, sold, or received cryptocurrency in 2020. The Cyberspace Administration of China announced that 105 apps, including LinkedIn, TikTok, and the video sharing app Kwai Show, used overcollection and excessive authorization to illegally infringe on personal user information. New regulations on data collection by apps from China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology came into effect May 1st, and the apps now have 15 working days to correct those issues. Amazon will shut down its standalone Prime Now and web, uh, Prime Now app and website worldwide by the end of the year. Amazon will move third-party partners, local stores, and all expedited delivery options to the main Amazon app and site. The information and Reuters sources say that Netflix is looking to hire an executive to oversee a new video game division, which could make the Apple versus Epic case that much more interesting because, you know, Netflix has been the non-video game video service. Uh, Netflix has tried interactive programming in the past with Black Mirror Bandersnatch and You versus Wild, where users could decide characters' moves. Also, it's created games based on shows like Stranger Things and La Casa de Papel. The information also noted that Netflix could offer a bundle of games similar to Apple Arcade as an option to subscribers. The Wall Street Journal sources say that Google called off long-running negotiations with its DeepMind Artificial Intelligence Unit seeking to grant DeepMind more autonomy. The founders of DeepMind had sought autonomy as far back as 2015, including proposing a partial spinoff, looking to establish an independent legal structure used by things like nonprofit groups, which reportedly did not make financial sense to Alphabet. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what Snap is up to. We talked about a new video editing app that Snap had launched yesterday. Snap also confirmed to The Verge it has agreed to buy Wave Optics for more than $500 million, which is Snap's largest acquisition ever. Wave Optics makes Wave Guides, a display technology that helps users overlay virtual objects into the real world through transparent surfaces and light projectors. This is used in Snap's fourth generation of spectacles glasses, which the company announced on Thursday. The new Snap spectacles have a 26.3 26 uh, 26 de degree field of view and also AR effects. Those are called lenses by Snap and are designed to be bright both indoors and outdoors. Cons, kind of big. Battery life is only 30 minutes if used the whole time and the glasses weigh 134 grams that's going to be a lot heavier than your standard sunglasses a spokesperson for snap says wave optics will continue to supply other companies with its wave guides but will make custom optical systems for snap in february of last year wave optics announced it had made the thinnest color wave guide available and several months ago it unveiled a wave guide for prescription glasses in partnership with lux excel now, spectacles, not widely available to buy yet, at least not this new fourth-gen version of them, though the company is offering units to developers and also content creators to create new experiences and filters with Snapchat's own Lens Studio tool. So consider this Snap's attempt to pull ahead in the AR glasses race, because we've talked about this in the past, but Google recently posted a handful of job listings around building wave guides. Apple bought holographic wave guide maker Econia back in 2018, and is said to be ready in AR glasses, perhaps even as early as, as later this year. And Facebook is also building custom waveguides for future AR glasses. Now, Patrick and Rich, I don't know if you saw these glasses. They're a little futuristic looking. 
But uh, it it does seem that Snap is Snap is all in on technology that that clearly we are still a few years out from this becoming a mainstream thing. I just, uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I'm just I, I I remember seeing that number and thinking a half billion dollars is a lot of money. And I don't remember the original Snap glasses being that super popular once the initial sort of, you know, this influencer has them and you don't. So go to this machine somewhere and, and get yours. Like, I, uh, I, I mean, a half I'm, billion dollars is also, a, I mean, in general, a lot of money, but specifically a lot of money for Snap too. I mean, they brought in, uh, I think it was $770 yeah. million dollars in revenue uh, in Q1. Um, so, you know, this is a significant spend for them. Obviously, this is a developer. I mean, it. I mean, it's being sold to developers. It's a developer kit. I can't imagine anything like this directly will be sold to consumers. We will see. They kind of remind me of the old spy tech glasses uh, that were a toy that had like mirrors <laughs> in the back of them a couple of years ago. The the big thing that stands out to me though is this field of view. It's 26 degrees, and Wave Optics has been making thinner and thinner uh, uh, lenses, like uh, you know Sarah, as you alluded to. But they're also getting narrower and narrower field of view as they get thinner. Um, I don't know if that's something they can overcome. For comparison, the original Hololens, which was criticized for having a very narrow field of view, had a 35 degree field of view. It's basically mm -hmm. like 26 is like basically looking down like a 90 millimeter lens, like that kind of crop. It's a it's a pretty tight area of of ar effectiveness or something like that i mean the the part of the problem with the hololens is is they show all these demonstration videos and you were you were looking at the <laughs> wall and, and they were showing you where the pipe was and where they wanted to put the door and this is going to solve all these architectural problems and then you put the the demo <laughs> goggles on and there was this like you know the equivalent of a bar of soap directly in front of your eyeballs <laughs> and everything around that was black <laughs> and you were like peering through this little you know cutout in the wall um, so yes, I would, I would hope field of vision, uh, gets bigger rather than smaller, but well, snap CEO, Evan Spiegel did say when, uh, you know, kind of talking a little bit about the spectacles and, and where the company saw it going, that we're about a decade out from this being something that, that we're really prepared to, to have people embrace, uh, in an everyday level. Snap also released a video that gives you a little bit more of an idea of, of where it's hoping development goes with spectacles as far as content creation. There was an interesting example of a woman who had, had spent a lot of time in New Mexico and there were all these points of interest that she was trying to guide somebody who would have gone to the places after her to, to know what's cool and where, you know, if you look at a certain sign, you get more contextual information. That's great, but she has to make that. And so Snap, banking on the fact that a lot of these creators are going to want to make this sort of stuff for Snap specifically, um, that's where I think, you know, this this all really hinges on uh, adoption on the creation side, because if you have a bunch of cool stuff, sure, you're going to sell a lot of glasses. But if there are only a few things, especially with, you know, battery life being woefully low, it's a right. it's a bit of a harder sell. I think it's and, it's also interesting that Snapchat or uh, Snap is is like they're they're the the amount of money they're making has increased spectacularly maybe more than i think people are aware of especially me um, <laughs> just all right <laughs> well yesterday we covered about how the citizen app had used its on-air live broadcasting feature to share personal information of a suspected arsonist of a los angeles area fire along with a thirty thousand dollar bounty 860,000 citizen users received the broadcast, and the on-air host encouraged them to help bring the man to justice, though after police detained the man, he was let go due to lack of evidence. Citizen says it failed to follow its own validation protocols. Today now, Citizen's back in the news. Motherboard reports leaked internal documents, plus its own sources at Citizen, detailing the company's plans to add private security work presence to the scenes of disturbances based on app user requests. So you could report a disturbance and theoretically have a security worker dispatched. Right now, Citizen uses uh, merely reported incidents in their neighborhoods. Using that info, along with police scanner transcriptions, the app sends real-time safety alerts to users about crime and other incidents happening near where a user is located. The security response project is being actively tested according to those internal emails. Two former Citizen employees tell Motherboard that it would work, uh, excuse me, uh, tells Motherboard that it would work uh, that when summoned, a private security company working with Citizen 
would provide to the response staff. Securitas, a private security contractor, is said to be one of the companies Citizen is working with, as is LAPS, or Los Angeles Professional Security. On Friday, Motherboard reported that Los Angeles Professional Security is also linked to a Citizen-branded vehicle seen driving around Los Angeles. A Citizen spokesperson says it's part of a pilot program, but declined to offer more details. Citizen currently has a subscription product called Protect, which sends a user's location to a Citizen employee. When it's turned on, they can stream video to a Protect agent, just someone watching the feed, when activated using a safe word. It costs $19.99 per month. Uh, If this uh, this service ever launches, I'm assuming it would probably cost more than that, although we would have to see on that. but God, I hope so. I, I, yeah. Uh, but, you know, Sarah, uh, kind of uh, a private security as a service, uh, kind of a uh, interesting direction for citizen. Yeah. Listen, I know that. OK, there's two different worlds, right? Here's the world that citizen goes like, well, hey, if if Sarah is a citizen user and something terrible is happening in her general area, you know, she's she sees somebody and she knows she's about to get you know, robbed, right? And she's able to hail a private security uh, worker that is working for a company that is a, has a contract with Citizen and that person comes in time and saves the day. Isn't that great for Sarah? She had no other choice. I mean, let's not even get into the fact that I used this rather than uh, contacting law enforcement for a second because that's a whole another issue. But okay, so that's that's in theory, okay, sure, right? You want to help keep good people safe. The problem is, is that, yeah, as you mentioned, Rich, you're already paying $20 to be like, heads up, citizen, I want to broadcast where I am when I feel unsafe at this particular time, but it's, why do I feel unsafe? What is going on? We, <laughs> for an app to be employing, whether it's direct employees within the company or contract workers working with the company, people coming out to like, you know, have some muscle over anybody that I find suspicious type of a thing, this gets weird really quickly. Uh, And we've seen, as you mentioned in yesterday's show, that, uh, you know, a manhunt on Citizen got out of control extremely quickly. And luckily, it didn't get worse. You know, you didn't get somebody convicted of a crime that they, they didn't commit, that almost a million people that were Citizen's users were told to actively help in the the uh, apprehension of yeah and the i mean just I, I just think of other kind of internet manhunts that we've had like the boston marathon bombing or something like that where we had people doing their own investigation and pointing fingers at people or like just even something like swatting uh, all of a sudden using these security yeah. forces now obviously if you have a citizen profile it'd be very easy to point the finger back you know, it's it's one thing if you live in a gated community or it's not it's not uncommon to have, you know, pri- pay private security to drive around your neighborhood or something like that or have something on call. It's when you introduce this level of scale where you can instantly broadcast a manhunt to 860,000 people as a private company who, you know, you, these are your paying customers. It's not it, it's a it's a different relationship, I guess, than, uh, you know, than like a than like a government or a citizen or something like that, that, right. you know, it, it could, I, like you said, Sarah, it can it can go off the rails pretty quick. Yeah, there's you know, there's also the, the question of, OK, sure, if I've got the money and for whatever reason, I feel like I need a layer of protection, private security. Sure. You know, you see it with, with you know, people in, in sort of the celebrity sphere all the time. Right. Uh, and uh, sometimes for good reason. But then what happens? Okay, let's say that there's some sort of incident. There's some sort of altercation. Well, you know, that citizen taking on quite a bit of risk. If the company is saying, well, this is a tool that we set up that our our citizen user is just use it's just using a feature that we gave her, but it has turned into a mess, you know. And and how does that how does that shake out legally? Yeah, I can imagine this screwing up a lot of things for actual law enforcement. If you have, you know, like like you said, they they had no evidence, even though they they you know identified this guy. He was eventually released. Um, I could see if a security force getting involved, especially if uh, you know if if the situation got violent or something like that, that could actually uh, you know mess up an investigation. 
Indeed. Uh, well, this one hopefully won't be violent, as <laughs> long as you like audio rooms. Before the launch <laughs> of its ticketed spaces feature in the next couple of weeks, Twitter is previewing this feature so that U.S. users can know what to expect when they host a ticketed space. All right, so this is how it works. Users can apply to host a paid live audio room if they have at least 1,000 followers. They have hosted three spaces in the past 30 days. Remember, spaces is basically Twitter's clubhouse competitor. They also have to be 18 years old or older. Twitter will cover transaction fees. It's partnered with Stripe, so Stripe is handling the payments. However, there is a little bit of a breakdown in who gets what money. 30% of App Store fees, either from Apple or Google, are going to apply, and this is a mobile feature. So of a $10 ticket, let's say, I'm charging you $10 to come to my, uh, my ticketed spaces talk. Well, that becomes $7. Then of that $7, Twitter takes 20% of that seven, I get the other 80. So still I'm making money, but you know, it's something to consider. Twitter says when applications open, they'll be processed within a few weeks and include a small US test group of hosts. Although anybody in the world can buy a ticket. So it, they're starting the rollout for hosts, but they're opening it up to the world as far as being able to come to the audio room. Spaces recently started allowing anyone with more than 600 followers to host free events. They can also schedule events. Those are two new features. And Twitter says it's working on co-hosted event capability. Patrick, what do you think about this? Is this, is, 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 if you're a big celebrity and your audience is on Twitter and you've got something to say, I can see you, this being a lucrative thing, but how many of those people are there? Patrick, I think you're muted. That'll teach me to actually touch my keyboard during a show. Um, one, <laughs> you know, there's there's an entire series of conversations between Epic and Apple right now about whether or not 30% uh, is too much, but 30% it is. Um, this is an additional revenue opportunity. This is an opportunity for Twitter to have the most famous people on Twitter generate money off of Twitter and therefore consider Twitter more valuable than say hosting a room in clubhouse. I mean, there's, there's a lot of complicated, messy stuff here. There's the whole, you know, there's been a whole huge debate about newsletters and our news, our newsletters, a legitimate source of revenue, or does it only happen when there's, you know, it's, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter if it, you know, if a hundred people pay you five dollars and that's five hundred dollars, you wouldn't have made otherwise. That's fantastic. If you have fifty thousand people paying five dollars, that's a large number, uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that's fantastic. Or maybe it's not. If you make that much money, that you can laugh at that. But I think Google, you know, I. I you guys were talking earlier about like Snap needs people to make content to make sure Snap stays viable. And this is Twitter wants to figure out reasons to make Twitter continue to be important to Twitter users um, or, or the people on Twitter that, that, that generate lots and lots of, of clicks and links. And, uh, you know, uh, as you know, as somebody who's watched, you know, processing and handling fees go up and up, uh, it would be nice if uh, these, these fees were less. Um, you mm -hmm. know, Twitter taking 20%, that's pretty hefty compared to a lot of other stuff out there. But, yeah, I mean, you know, if you, if you look at the math, I mean, you know, the, the creator, whoever's hosting that's getting 56% of whatever that ticket was, um, you know, certainly, the, so this is, this is the bargain that every creator or every, you know, uh, Twitter user, whether they want to go through the, you know, the extra effort of either managing uh, uh, Patreon or some other sort of crowdfunding platform to then host that content, which had its own set of fees and its own, you know, compromises and inconvenience. Uh, but that's going to be, I'm assuming it's going to be less for most instances than 56% like blanket fee. Uh, whether the convenience of one click, I'm instantly, you know, I, I can pay with Apple Pay or, or Google Pay or whatever, uh, instantly kind of be in that room. It's a seamless transaction if that's worth uh, basically half of, you know, of your ticket price. I, I think that's an open question. i certainly, listen, people will go for a long way for convenience. I'm not saying that. And this is definitely an integrate, uh, uh, seems like it'll be a nice integrated solution. That's just a, that's a big slice of the pie. Yeah. The whole, the whole idea that there are so many clubhouse clones now, and for the most part, Clubhouse is the only standalone product, right? All the other big platforms said, oh, well, let's just bundle something that Clubhouse does into our existing platform, which to me makes a lot more sense. 
The nice thing about Clubhouse, and I'm not a huge fan of the app, uh, just because I don't know. There's only so many audio rooms I can I can I can, <laughs> uh, jo- you know, drop in on. But that was sort of the beauty of it is I could kind of bounce around. You know, as long as I had access to the app, I wasn't. You know, if I was sort of not into a conversation or I had something else to do. It did, wasn't really a big deal if I if I uh, jumped out or maybe switched over to something I thought was more interesting. You know, once you get me to pay for something and I feel like, oh, this is really worth my money. You know, this is, you know, my favorite, I don't know, guitarist t- teaching me how he made that one song kind of thing. I'm just, you know, spitballing here. Uh, that that might be great. I'm going to say, yeah, I, I'm glad I paid these $10 and I don't really care how they split it up. I'm, I'm just glad that I have access. But if it's not great, it, it I wonder how the content that's being offered uh, will change. Because if you're a certain caliber of celebrity or, or otherwise notable person, sure, you can get away with just charging and you do whatever and people are happy to be there. But a lot of people who are popular on Twitter might have to rethink like, eh, you're not just going to start a stream and, and riff. You have to have a little bit more of a plan going in. Well, if you want to join the conversation in our Discord, which is going 24-7, you can join it by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, last week, pre-orders for the Framework laptop opened up. It's a modular laptop designed to be easily repaired and upgraded over time. There's even a DIY kit available where you can put yourself to, you can put it together yourself if you're into that sort of thing. It's great that consumers have these kind of options to buy something that's repairable by design. Although, to be fair, no one has had any time hands-on time with the Framework laptop. We really haven't seen reviews out, so we don't know if that one's any particularly any good. But for consumers who own a laptop from other vendors the right to repair becomes a really important question. So, Patrick, I know this is a this is an area of, of passion and interest for you. Uh, what right does, I, I guess, kind of, can you break it down? What right does the everyday consumer or even an independent technician have when it comes to repairing tech? Boy, this is a complicated and messy question. Um, <laughs> it, it was funny also, because I was chatting online with a couple of friends, uh, or on Twitter, I should say, about the framework laptop, which led to, one person being like, oh, you know, people need to think about, right, you know, if if it's not glued shut, you know, it won't be as waterproof and repairs it. And I'm babbling, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I, I babble because it's been kind of fascinating to watch the reactions because right to repair bills have have been, you know, floating up uh, at the state level all over the place for the last few years. And some of the responses to those get really fascinating. But uh, you know, you had a link on here about uh, the French repairability intakes. Uh, there's been a lot of news lately. I think Vice did an article about how leaked Apple blueprints, uh, blueprints were helping independent technicians repair things. And, you know, the first thing I should point out is upgrading or an upgradable product is not the same as right to repair. But devices that are designed to be upgraded are often significantly easier to repair because for example, they're designed to be opened. And that's one of the challenges with a lot of things. Uh, there was one notable, I can't remember, maybe it was a debate in New Hampshire where the uh, the, the member of the 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 uh, the, 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 the response was like, eh, cell phones are supposed to, they're just going to be disposable. Eh, we don't need a right to repair a bill. And uh, that's an interesting kind of response because the vast majority of something – in the neighborhood of a half a million phones get disposed of on a, on a I want to say a monthly basis, uh, maybe five or twenty percent of those, depending on whose number you're looking at, actually get recycled. So, all of this stuff is ending up in landfills, which is generally bad. And when you look at studies uh, like Peer did a study, and increasing repairability can save families hundreds of dollars per year because their devices last longer; they can keep them running longer. Um, you know, being able to open devices, mod and repair, and <clears throat> unlock and jailbreak the software electronics, those are like the foundations of uh, what the iFixit folks call their consumer bill of rights. And I, I mentioned iFixit because they were an organization that came out very, very early to try to do things like help you repair your iPhone, for example. Uh, they came up with tools. So when Apple was like, we're going to put a f- special five-star, five star 5 pointed pentastar <laughs> screw on our devices so nobody will be able to open them. Well, they commissioned their own screwdrivers so that you could open that up. They have uh, tens of thousands of guides, repair guides, not just for electronics, but for stuff like washing machines. And, um, you know, 
in, you, you don't just need tools or parts or, or the ability to open something up, but you need repair information, um, you know, reasonably priced independent repair shops. And a lot of people are like, that's ridiculous. But you see, it already exists. And this battle is already played out for your car, for example. Uh, there was a big uh, fight in Massachusetts to do things like make OBD2 codes available so you could find out what that, you know, check engine light. Well, that's an <laughs> OBD2 code. OK, well, how do I do that? Well, you go to the dealer and you pay $100 and then they tell you whether or not you'll have to pay thousands more. Um, and, uh, you know, this is this is an idea that if this information is made available, then more things can be repaired and fixed uh, and more affordable. Um, there's a really weird article when you search for right to repair. This is really weird uh, opinion piece. that shows up from uh, uh, IEEE.org's uh, uh, spectrum. And, you know, I, I'm going to grossly oversimplify it. And I just want to say right to repair is not forcing you to repair your own items. There seems to be a little confusion there, at least in this one article, and it's a very popular article, which means it's linked to or, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, nobody's forcing you to get a screwdriver and a soldering gun and a magnifying glass and just dive in there. Right. Because not everybody wants to or needs to repair their devices. But, um, you know, there was a really kind of a the biggest recent update around this was uh, an FTC report called Nixing the Fix or the, the full title is nixing the fix and FTC reports on to Congress on repair restrictions. And it talks about that, you know, uh, warranties are being voided, which is a violation of the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, which goes back to 1975, which basically says, hey, if you offer a warranty, there's some things you need to do for it to be OK for you to offer a warranty, which sounds a little strange until you start looking at sort of what was happening uh, back then with warranties being voided for specious reasons. Um, yeah, I kind of cycle this back to cars again because the Magnuson Moss Act is a big deal because it used to be like you would take your truck to the dealer because there was a carburetor problem. And the dealer was like, you put oversized tires on that. You voided your warranty. So you're going to have to pay full ticket for that carburetor that exploded well inside the warranty repair period. Um, <laughs> I'm oversimplifying and I'm using my Cooper <laughs> voice, but, but this is the kind of stuff that would, that would happen. Um, you know, so there's a really great, I'm going to kind of, try to synthesize this, but that FTC report, which was pretty, you know, across the aisle and, and uh, supported by all the political parties, uh, quote, even when a warranty does not explicitly require that repairs be performed by the original equipment manufacturer, the OEM, using OEM parts, many manufacturers restrict independent repair and repair by consumers through product designs that complicate or prevent repair. Unavailability of parts and repair information, designs that make independent repairs less safe, policies or statements that steer consumers to manufacture repair networks, application of patent rights and enforcement of trademarks, disparagement of non-OEM parts or independent repairs, software locks or firmware updates, and user license agreements. Um, you know, using things like the DMCA to prevent people from repairing their hardware is a little weird. Um, you know, but it's an interesting battle that's going on. And a lot of it is about whether or not things should be disposable, whether or not you should be forced to, you know, and when you look at some of the studies, it's like there was a, I want to say an Illinois study on hospital equipment uh, and the total life. And if you had to use the OEM for repair, the cost was generally 20 cent, 20% 20 higher, 18 or 20% higher than if you, the hospital was able to use independent repair shops. So, you know, the, one of the things the FTC commission came together and, and said is, you know, based on a review of comments submitted and materials presented during the workshop, there's scant evidence to support manufacturers' justifications for repair restrictions. Uh, and I'll be honest, I'm not an unbiased observer in this. I believe that you should be able to repair things. I believe that you should be able to fix things to keep them out of landfills to conserve resources. Um, and because I'm also an inveterate breaker of screens, uh, <laughs> at least when they're not armored. Uh, and I think it's nice when you can fix the things you own uh, instead of, you know, recycling them or uh, giving up on them. But uh, right now there is a lot of stuff out there in terms of or fights. Uh, Rightsrepair.org is really interesting to look at. And also be aware, especially if you live in an agricultural state, you may notice that there is a heavily supported bill for agricultural right to repair, but the consumer electronics products bills kind of languish, which, uh, hmm. well, there's conversation for another day. <laughs> well, well, it's a, it's something that we'll definitely, you know, we'll keep talking about as we learn more about it. But I think at the very least, you know, some of the points that you covered where, you know, a company could say, eh, it's just dangerous for you as a consumer to do this. So we're just going to 
we're going to take that danger off of your hands may be true in certain senses. You mentioned hospitals. Well, there's, there, there may be is a reason that the hospital really needs to go through the OEM, but not always. Um, and it's, it's better to give some, give some control back to the consumer. All right, Rich, let's check out the mailbag. All right, Sarah, sounds like a plan. Well, we got an email in response to Chris Christensen's underwater photo tip from yesterday's show, and Comey had an idea. He said, I believe a 360 degree camera would be great for underwater photo and video. With the invisible selfie stick, which is kind of sits in the blind spot of the 360 camera, it would look like you took another diver underwater to film you. You can keep the 360 video rolling and crop it later to get regular video in any direction. The only downside is if you crop regular video, the resolution is lower than something like a 4K GoPro. For example, if your 360 video is 5.7K, it becomes about 720P if you crop an 80, uh, 80 degree uh, field of view from it. I had a good experience with the Insta360 One series, and he would recommend the 1R and 1X2, and the Ricoh Theta series, which is like those little handheld uh, Ricoh 360 cameras. Some models are waterproof, but I think you need an underwater case for diving. Probably well advised, but, uh, <laughs> but good thoughts i've heard i've heard good things uh about that insta 360 so i bet you uh i bet you'd be up for the task yeah that's good stuff thanks Kome. and you know even if it drops down to 720p it's like you know for an underwater photo it still still gives you some fun creativity to be had uh if you have any feedback on anything that we talk about on the show like Kome did today please do send it our way questions comments Everything is welcome. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Pat Sheeran, Erwin Sturr, and Philip Shane. We'd also like to thank our brand new boss. Your name is Catherine, and we love you. We just started <laughs> back at us on Patreon, so thanks, Catherine. You boss you. Well, and you may have noticed Len Peralta on the show today, and Len has uh, put together some fantastic artwork for us. Len, what do you got for us today? Well, thanks, Rich. You know, I find uh, ticketed spaces in Twitter very interesting. Uh, however, I feel that Twitter is missing a, um, a, a marketing angle here. Uh, I think they can call the tickets Twickets. Right. I mean, am I am I alone in this? Right. I think Twickets. Right. And not only that, but the image I drew today, someone had mentioned in the chat. How does Ticketmaster come into this? Well, this guy, uh, the image is of a scalper who is scal scalping these, quote unquote, Twickets. And of course, he's from Ticketmaster selling them for 300 bucks a pop. So uh, who knows? Ticketed spaces, interesting stuff. Who knows what's going to happen? But uh, this image is available right now at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Also at my online store, lenperaltastore.com. And you can watch me every week on twitch.tv forward slash Len Peralta. You can watch me put this together live and actually help uh, me put it together just like some of the people in the chat room did. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Len. Great stuff as always. Twickets. I mean, you know, <laughs> they had it right in front of them. How does Twitter not yeah. pick that up? Yeah, of course. <laughs> also, thanks to Patrick Martin for being with us today. Patrick, where can people keep up with the rest of your work? Because you're a busy man. Uh, AVXL.com is is always a good place. Uh, that is the podcast I host with Robert Heron about home theater and audio. Or just go over to the Twitters and look for at Patrick Norton. Excellent. We are live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Rich and I are back on Monday, and we'll be joined by Nate Langson. Talk to you then, and have a great weekend. This week's episodes this of Daily Tech Mark. News Show was created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer, Booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Drofolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Intern, Dr. Nicole Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Joe Zoe Detterling. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCow, Capt Kipper, and Jack Shit. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Creative Ast Arts. Acast ad support from Great Trace Gainer. Patreon support from Stephen Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. Guests on this week's show included Jen Cutter and Rob DeMillo. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. 
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>